This is Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort. Great to be with you on another edition of Transit Unplugged in Depth, the world's leading transit executive podcast. Today, we bring you a recording from a recent webinar I held with three of the leading transit executives in Africa and the Middle East for a Connected Journeys podcast. We'll be talking to former guest Ahmed Barozian, who is CEO of the Roads and Transport Authority in Dubai, and Abimala Akinajo, CEO of Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority in Nigeria. And they're joined by new guest, Dijan Fanny, who is Director of Operations for the Transit System in Abidjan. Great to have all of them with us, and they really bring you insights into what's happening in their transit systems, all of which are very forward-leaning. Hope you enjoyed this podcast, and let us know what you think, as always, by sending us a note at info at transitunplugged.com. Thanks, and enjoy. Hey, we've got a great team of guests today. Um, Ahmed Barazion was one of our highest listened to ever podcasts in the history of our show when he was on as a guest uh, of Transit Unplugged. And Abin Bola had amazing listenership as well. They've both been guests on the program. And John is my new friend who I've met recently over the last few weeks. And so we're excited to hear what they have to say today. But I'd like each of them, as I call on them, to kind of introduce themselves a little bit, what they do, what their job is and a little bit about their transportation service. And then if you can also tell us about what ridership levels are like before COVID and after COVID, I think those numbers are interesting. And um, so we'll start out with Ahmad. Ahmad, would you mind kicking us off and tell us a little bit about what you're doing there in Dubai? Sure. Uh, thank you, Paul. And, and uh, great to be here with the English panelists as well as all the people who are with us um, on the show. Um, uh, in Dubai, of course, you know, public transport uh, is something that the city has been focusing on more or less uh, for the last 15 years or so. Of course, we are a young city, so 15 years for us is quite a long time compared to uh, other cities. But um, we've managed to increase the public transport ridership share from about 6% about, you know, 15 years ago to it's around 70%, 17, sorry, percent, one seven right now. Which is a significant, um, significant increase, and we also have a vision to increase that uh, further up to about 26, 27 percent by 2030. So we are pushing different in direction of competing against private cars uh, and, and getting people to to use public transport, and not only public transport in its traditional terminology, but also the the more you like modern modes of mobility. Um, uh, and soft mobility solutions as well. So we're focusing a lot on, and we'll talk a little bit more about what are the different modes we're, uh, we're focusing on. Um, like any other city, as you mentioned, Paul, you know, we've been hit also by COVID in the last year and a half. We've had a significant dip in our um, ridership across all different modes. Uh, I think we're happy to say that um, we have recovered, uh, maybe more so than many other cities around the world. I think partially that's due to Dubai as a city has been able to control this pandemic quite well, and we've, we've actually almost pretty much back to life as normal, uh, with the exception of course wearing face masks, etc. But pretty much the city is open, um, both for tourism as well as for uh, for you know individual uh, movement. Um, but at the same time, I think we've also focused a lot in the RTA um, about maintaining very very stringent and uh, I would say world uh, world renowned standards for. Uh, sanitization and and keeping our our transport system safe and that has been a significant reason for us uh, rebounding fairly quickly so just to give you an example um our taxi service for example has rebounded about 80 percent to what it was pre-covid and overall across all modes of transport we're around 70 percent as an average across different modes of transport so that's that's fairly good compared to some of the other cities around the world and we hope that as we get closer to expo 2020 um, which is coming up um, uh, um, in, in October of this year uh, and goes on till April of 2022, the city will continue to open up more, tourism will open up more, so we expect ridership to rebound um, uh, even further. So in a nutshell, that's, that's where we're at right now, and I hope that um, in the upcoming conversations, I'll be able to add, shed more light around where we're headed in terms of technology and future mobility. That's great. Thank you, Ahmed. Great. Uh, great to see your city is uh, getting more back to normal, your country is, and also that ridership is increasing so dramatically. That's wonderful. Abin Bola, you told me a couple months ago uh, that your ridership was up, I think, over 90% what it was pre-COVID. How are things going? Tell us a little about yourself and where things are at now. Thank you. My name is Abin Bola Kianjo, Managing Director of La Mata, Lagos Metropolitan Area Transportation Authority. Uh, we're the authority responsible for public transportation, but mainly road and rail 
public transportation. We have another authority that's responsible for water transportation. But from the perspective of planning, LAMATA sort of integrates both uh, rail, road, and water. Um, from uh, Lagos's perspective, uh, we have, like I was saying earlier, we have a huge ridership. Lagos is the smallest city or state in Lagos State, but we have the largest population. So we have like one tenth of the population of Lake of Nigeria. Uh, so we have about 20, 22, 20, anything up to 22 million people in Lagos. Um, but the land size of Lagos is really the smallest city in in the whole of Nigeria. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that we are also a third of that city is water. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we are now, the current government is developing the water transportation aggressively to ensure that we utilize that also for moving the huge mass of people that we have. Uh, from a transportation perspective, as we have been hit by COVID, um, and I think the difference for uh, a city like Lagos and the Western cities is the mode in which we work. Uh, most cities, around the world have said all of their um, people, most of the people should work from home and all of that is working fine for a lot of them. But understand the fact that within a developing uh, country like Nigeria, most people have to come out their daily uh, wage earners. So they have to come out to work. And I think that's one of the reasons why our ridership numbers went, you know, okay, went way down during COVID, um, the lockdown and all of that. But the minute we opened up, the majority of the people had to come out regardless to go to work. So our transportation uh, numbers, uh, ridership, you know, sort of surged straight back to circa 90% and we're still there. Uh, so the challenge for the state is to ensure that we find other means of ensuring that people protect themselves whilst they are out. So the sanitizers, the washing of hands, the um, using of uh, face masks, like um, Ahmed was talking about in Dubai, is one of the things that we have encouraged within Lagos to sort of stem the spread of COVID. Um, so that's what we are. But in terms of um, public transportation, there's, we, you know, we experience uh, circa 20 million trips in a day, because everybody is out on the roads. There's a lot of the huge uh, portion of that ridership is done via roads at the moment. And uh, we are in the process of building our first two um, real metro systems. And we are hoping those will be available to for operations come the end of 2022. There's a lot of emphasis on water transportation as well. Currently, water transportation is doing less than, oh, I don't know, less than 1% of um, the demand and the drive right now is to try and push them in the direction of 6% and that is going ongoing. So for Lagos um, uh, and for La Mata, uh, public transportation is taking a, a reasonable turn for, for the better uh, with the advent of the new uh, rail systems that are coming. BRT lines are being implemented. We've opened three of them and we're introducing a number of high capacity buses just to move our, tease our people away from dependencies on their private cars. That's where we are in Lagos. Thank you. Very good, Abimbola. So tell me that number one more time. I want people to hear. How many people are riding on a daily basis? We, have, we, we, we do about two, two, 20 million trips a day. But understand that public transportation, part of that trip is about, is about 12 to 14 million. And the majority of that is on roads. Right. Understood. That's still a lot of trips. <laughs> so... Uh, very good. And John Fanny, my new friend, uh, tell us about yourself, uh, your operation, your country some, and uh, what you all are doing there right now coming out of COVID. Okay. I am John Fanny, Director of Operation at uh, Amiga, which is uh, the Greater Abidjan Urban Mobility Authority. It is a newly created authority uh, because we have been uh, many political issues from uh, the 10 past years. And I think 20, 20 past years. So uh, the Amiga have been created two years ago uh, because there have been many reforms on the mobility, urban mobility. So Amiga is uh, working on the greater Abidjan area. Abidjan is the, the biggest city in, in Côte d'Ivoire. As far as uh, COVID uh, is concerned, uh, 
And let's say that we, we, we don't have the same impact of COVID in Cote d'Ivoire, like in, in developed countries, that what we are seeing on, on TV and in, in, in news. Because here, the COVID, we had a, a, a first peak uh, last year, which lasted around uh, five, five months, during which we felt the, the, the impact on the urban mobility because most of companies were working uh, from home. And also the, the, the daily trips had a, a big drop from around uh, uh, 30%. So this, this has been during those five months. So right now the, the traffic is, has come back to its uh, usual, I mean, uh, level. We had uh, we have around uh, 17 million trees per day in, in, in Abidjan. So uh, the, the impact of the COVID, as I said, is has been very limited in the in the in the in the time. So this is why what can say about the ridership level before and, and, and now. So what we're doing to improve the ridership level is that we are constructing three uh, mass transport system now in, in Abidjan. We have the metro, which is a 35 kilometers lane of metro going from the north to the south of the city. Uh, we also have two uh, suit free BRT projects that are ongoing. The, the works are going to start next year. Uh, because we are finishing, uh, finalizing now the, the study uh, of the two BRT lanes, which have a big intersection at the Carrefour de la Vie in Cocody. So these are the free mass transport system that we are uh, constructing uh, so that to, to improve qualitatively the, the level of service of our transport system. As far as uh, private operators are concerned, we are also working uh, on, on profiling and identifying them because we are in the process of renewing the, the global transport fleet in Abidjan. So this is the summary of what we are working on. Very good. Thank you, Sean. That was a great, great uh, review of it. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about uh, for the three transit systems that our, uh, our guests represent. And now we're going to ask some individual questions. Abin Bola, let's kick it off with you. Uh, Two, really a two-part question. How are you changing your service to match the new types of passenger demand? And then, since this topic is really about integrated transportation networks, and I know you do that well there, talk about how you have integration. So the first part of it is, um, how are you matching the new types of demand? And then talk to us about the integration you currently have. Okay, so um, how are we dealing with the new uh, passenger demand? And um, The way we've seen it is that, like I said, we have a huge... Uh, transportation demand. And what we've done historically uh, within La Mata is we've uh, implemented a BRT service. But right now we have sort of looked at Lagos um, from La Mata's perspective. We have di divided Lagos into seven zones such that we can begin to understand interconnectivity between the zones where people are originating from, where they're going. So we've done a number of surveys and we now have a fairly good understanding of our travel patterns and, 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 and the way in which people are traveling. And in doing that division that we've done, we have now started to design routes to cater to people's um, demand needs. Uh, whereas historically, we've just looked at um, where uh, people sort of live and where they go to work. Uh, so within what we've done now, we now have bus, we've designed new bus routes and we have uh, we have put out a number a, a large number of uh, new um, bus systems. So we have created what we call a bus reform initiative. That bus reform initiative starts obviously with the BRT routes, and then we have what we call the standard routes, which are routes that are in mixed traffic. The BRT routes are traveling along dedicated routes. Then we have buses that run within the mixed mix traffic, but they are high capacity and medium capacity buses. And then we have what we call the first and the last mile buses. These first and the last mile buses, they're the ones that will take you closest to your destination. So those buses will bring you from your homes, your offices, and will take you to a bus terminal, a ferry terminal, or a train station when they come. Uh, that bus reform initiative is being implemented as I speak. So we have put a number of new buses, high capacity and medium capacity buses within the mixed traffic to cater for zonal tra transportation as well as interzonal transportation. 
within the um, first and last mile buses, we have the same thing. Majorly, the uh, first and last mile buses, they operate within a zone. They don't cross zones. So it is to ensure that they take you from your destination or from your origin to a, a major transportation interchange or terminal. Either it's a bus terminal. We're also implementing a number of bus terminals as per our transportation master plan. Lamata has a transportation master plan that had been designed to cater for the whole of Lagos. So we're doggedly implementing that transportation master plan. We're improving it um, every five or so years to ensure that we cater for the future as we go on. So the bus reform initiative is actually um, being implemented and it's working very well for us because we've introduced new buses. We're working with private sector to bring in more rolling stock for the buses, more buses for us. And we, we are plugging them in the areas that have been identified as needed. Now, the other thing we're doing, we're obviously also implementing a number of projects. For the buses, we're building um, what we call quality bus corridors. So they will work within traffic, but they will also have uh, sort of like dedicated bus lanes or they will have um, priority um, traveling um, lane, not just the lane, but in, in traffic cater systems. So when they get to a traffic light and the traffic light recognizes it's a bus, it will allow it go quickly. That allows us to move people, mass people quicker. And that we feel when people begin to see the result of those, they'll be more inclined to move onto public transportation system because the key KPI that we have is to reduce journey time. So that's a major KPI for Lamata to reduce journey time. And that's what we study Good. with our buses. Yes. How do we ensure that when you're on public transportation, your bus journey time is reduced? So if I think about the um, Abulek Baoshodi um, new BRT that we've just launched, that road you will do two and a half hours in traffic. But we've wow. been studying the um, KPI for the uh, BRT and we see that the maximum is 45 minutes. And you can do it in as little as 40 minutes. So that has been increasing the ridership on that BRT because we put that information out there. That it takes you 45 minutes on the BRT, but it'll take you two and a half hours if you choose yeah. to sit in the car. It's all about choice. That's um, right. So uh, from that's the sort of things that we're doing to enhance public transportation, apart from also the fact that we're building our uh, metro system. For now, there are two metro systems that are connecting north to south, east to west. So we have um, the one from east to west, it's a blue line, it's going from uh, one end of uh, town from the east to the west. And that is about 13 kilometers. The whole of it is 26 kilometers. We're building the first phase and that will take you from a place we call Mile 2 where there's a lot of residentials and it will take you into the area where there's businesses. So those two, red, the red line and the blue line, will be completed come 2022. And we're keeping every digit cross that 2022 November, we will be operational. Both of those rail lines will be operational. So those are the things that we're doing. And also with regard to ferry, water transportation, that is being grown in Lagos massively as we speak. There are about 14 jetty terminals being built by the government. And there are um, recently uh, government increased its fleet from seven to 21. Now there is an authority for water transportation, but we sit, Lamata sits with them from a perspective of planning. So to think about it from an integrated intermodal transportation, what yes. we're now doing is to ensure that all of these systems are connected. So when I look at um, my blue line, for instance, every station, that it is connected either with a BRT bus terminal or a regular bus terminal. So you know that you can get off the train and get onto a bus. You can get off the train and get, I have two major interchanges, one in Marina. Marina has water, has rail and has bus transportation, has the BRT, has standard bus routes, all in Marina. So in that area of Marina, which is a huge um, commercial district for Lagos, all forms of transportation can be obtained from the marina interchange. I have the same interchange replicated in Mile 2. And I have a number of those on my um, uh, transport master plan that we will implement. But for in the next two to two and a half years, we will implement those two major um, transportation interchanges. But beyond that, every time I build a bus terminal, I am aware that uh, Lamata as, a, as an entity and ensures that we are planning a bus terminal close to a rail station 
or as close as possible to a water transportation system. Because we recognize that when we have them in silos, you don't move people efficiently. And our KPI will not count because then if I have to come off a bus and wait another 20 minutes to get on another mode, then my journey time increases. So the vision is to ensure that we reduce journey time for the passenger via public transportation to tease them away from using their cars. What a great story. Thanks. And now on to Ahmed, uh, my friend from Dubai. You guys are working on all kinds of new technologies over there. It just fascinates me to watch and see how these announcements are being made. Tell us about some of the new types of technology you're introducing or feel you might need now. I think one of the important points that was mentioned earlier by Abin Bola was a very important statement that it's all about choice. And, uh, and basically what all of us are doing here really is competing against the private car and trying to answer the question of how can we get people out of their own individual cars, which are normally more convenient, onto uh, other, the modes that uh, are shared, shared mobility um, and, and public transport systems. Now, in Dubai, um, that's a big challenge for us because compared to many cities around the world, especially the advanced uh, international cities, uh, owning a car is very cheap. Uh, fuel prices are extremely cheap as well. Um, and of course, the heat, the, the weather, most of the year, it's very difficult for people to walk even short distances uh, to reach the nearest public transport system or to move from the, um, their, 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 final, their final destination, be it their office or their home. So these are challenges. Now, when people choose uh, to leave their cars behind, I would argue they, they look for certain uh, aspects. My argument is safety is number one. Uh, it's fine if we can reduce uh, travel times and the waiting time, yes, but if our, the modes of transport are not safe and people, you know, they, they, they're high accidents or people don't feel safe at night, for example, on buses and taxis, um, that to me is number one priority. So technology for us is, 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 is focused on multiple areas. Uh, safety is one of them. Uh, with the help of trapeze, I might add, for example, in taxis in Dubai, uh, we have multiple cameras in taxis that not only capture um, what's going on inside the taxi. Um, but at the same time, we have a layer of artificial intelligence built on top of those cameras that allow us to, um, to, 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 to have alerts, for example, if certain activities are going on within, uh, within the taxi. So it allows us as authorities to get involved rather than the traditional way of having to look at taxis on about 11,000 um, cameras, sorry, on about 11,000 taxis, which becomes almost impossible. We actually depend on the AI layer to alert us on what are the activities that are ongoing on, whether it be a driver behavior, whether it be a, you know, uh, argument, for example, between passengers and drivers inside the taxi that allow us to proactively get involved before um, something happens or a complaint is generated by the customer. So really trying to go from reactive use of technology to proactive use of technology. And you can only do that. Uh, uh, fine, we can all have cameras and can have technology systems, but if you don't have a big data platform and an artificial intelligence layer on top of that, it becomes very difficult to become proactive. So that's really the next generation of technology use that we're looking at. Um, so safety we talked about, um, and also integration. Of course, integration, we've all talked about integration, but you can't underestimate the importance of integration um, in a, a dependable public transport and mobility ecosystem in any city uh, around the world. So the way we look at integration in Dubai, there are three aspects to integration. So one is physical integration. So physically having um, the laybys, for example, to allow people coming out of a taxi or of a bus, sorry, a metro station uh, to have uh, the laybys for buses, the laybys for taxis. So physically making sure that the integration um, uh, or the infrastructure is ready for an integrated mobility hubs which we are trying to build here in Dubai. Um, multimodal is very important for us. So uh, not only the traditional mode of buses and taxis to complement the metro system, but really focusing on soft mobility going forward. So in Dubai now, it's actually, uh, when you come out of a metro station, yes, you're, you're going to see buses uh, that are integrated with the, uh, with the metro, you're going to see taxis, but increasingly you're going to see bikes and you're going to see scooters uh, and other soft mobility modes uh, that we believe are extremely convenient, uh, very uh, reasonably priced to allow people to make that last mile, which is extremely crucial in a city like Dubai, where, as I mentioned, the weather is not very uh, conducive to walking. Um, and thirdly, uh, using technology to bring all of these integration, uh, these multimodal systems together under one platform. So um, as you increase the number of offerings that you have in your mobility ecosystem, like we are trying to do in Dubai, um, if you don't have an integrated mobility solution 
uh, that can present all of this to an app, for example, to the, the customer, you may lead to confusion, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and bringing all those under one umbrella in a mobility as a service or a journey planner application is also something that we feel is extremely important uh, to support uh, integration. So that's really where we're headed in the future with regard to how we want to encourage people to um, you know, uh, leave their private cars, maybe not completely. I mean, we have to be realistic as well, but certain journeys or certain percentage of journeys in the day, we want people to consider strongly public transport and mobility solutions versus their private cars. And these are the certain aspects, safety, dependability, and integration is what we're aiming for. And technology, of course, plays a major role in all three of those. Hey, I just looked up the weather in Dubai right now. <laughs> I see what you mean. Uh, for, for us here in America, it's 106 degrees there today and going up to 109 this week, 41 to 42 degrees Celsius. You are kidding. That is kind of hot to walk around in. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's actually yeah. quite uh, quite uh, reasonable today compared to, uh, so we would normally be at around 120 degrees around this time of the year. So you can Holy imagine. Moly. So are your bus stops uh, air conditioned? <laughs> well, we, we do have approximately, uh, yes, five, five um, sorry, about, about 500, 600 of our bus stops are air conditioned. Uh, wow. actually, and and uh, it's interesting, actually, that maybe something we nobody talked about yet, but for us, um, since you brought that up, um, private-public partnerships as we go forward, because as we see, especially with the uh, as, as as we hopefully start getting out of this COVID pandemic, we know that funding for infrastructure projects is going to be a challenge in Dubai and anywhere else in the world as well. So I think we all need to consider innovative uh, or different ways to finance our uh, infrastructure going forward. And public-private partnerships is probably one of the Key ways that Dubai is doing that. So we are very close to finalizing deals uh, with private enterprises that will allow them or require them to build um, uh, infrastructure for us, especially the bus stops. So converting our traditional, very basic bus stops here in Dubai, and there are about 1,500 of those, into partially air-conditioned or at least shaded bus stops um, through the private sector and allowing the private sector to recover that investment through advertising, uh, ownership of data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these models, I think, will become increasingly prevalent, not only in Dubai, but in other cities in the world, as we all struggle to secure government funding going forward for major infrastructure projects, I believe. That's really good. And I, I, I believe in that model uh, strongly. I think that's great, Ahmed. You know, you were talking about funding, uh, and funding, of course, has become a big issue as fair revenue has declined with ridership. Across the world, some transit agencies are getting 12 to 25 percent of their fare box recovery ratio. Others are much higher than that. But it really took a hit during COVID. Uh, and um, I guess I wanted to switch over to Abimbola and ask about that. How are you managing fare prices and payment availabilities? Is contactless part of your strategy? Somebody put a question in the uh, in the Q and A anyway regarding. Okay. Uh, uh, our payment system. So we last year launched uh, a car record system, which is um, an e-ticketing system, a, a card payment system. And that's what we've been using. So for Lagos, we have decided that um, for regulated transportation, at least all of our payments will be done um, via this card. And we have been using that very successfully. Uh, for about a year. We started on the 13th of August. And um, so we're around about a year now. And that has been a very um, successful mode of payment for all forms of transportation. Recently, we um, added the water transportation onto it. It started off with the buses. Uh, the water transportation is using it. And when we start with our real transportation system, they will use the same. So this card for us is um, part of uh, what enhances or what will enhance our integrated transportation system. One singular payment type is what we will use across all modes of transportation. It's really interesting listening to Ahmed about the um, ITS system. This is something that Lagos State is working toward. Um, we started off with an ITS system that we're finding too expensive for our palette at the moment, and we're looking for ways in which we can utilize and ensure that we have an ITS system that will gel together pretty much as uh, Ahmed was saying, all of what we're putting together. An integrated transportation system needs all forms, not just the physical, but also this um, 
technology to ensure uh, connectivity for everybody and also the availability of information to the commuter. So when I have a system that tells you that you can look on, on this app and know when a bus will arrive or how frequently a bus will arrive or how frequently a train will arrive and how connected uh, the bus and the train is or the ferry and the, tra- uh, and the uh, bus services, it allows that uh, passenger that much more willingness to opt for public transportation. The predictability of public transportation makes it easier to make that choice. The way a lot of us work now where, you know, you turn up at the bus stop and it's anybody's guess when the bus is coming, you are not certain. You you, you may even have that knowledge of the bus timetable and the train timetable, but they're not connected. And that lack between the two modes can be what finally makes you decide against public transportation. All of that will be addressed when we have an ITS system. And that's something we are, uh, in this year, we are looking to fill that gap. We've been talking to a number of um, providers and we hope to close with somebody by the end of the year to ensure that we have that um, uh, ITS system. But with regard to our uh, payment system, our payment system is one singular payment system across all modes of transportation for us. Uh, It's a card system. And um, what we're looking at, funny enough, just before I came on here, we had a meeting with um, our payment system people. What we're looking at, at the moment, it is a closed system. And what we're choosing to do is to keep it closed, understand all of our quirks and our issues before we open it up, such that um, different card modes can also come onto it. Uh, We tried it out historically about um, 13 years ago, we had a payment system and it just did not function well. And I think it's partly because we took on too much too quickly. So now we're really taking our time. Uptake has been very good. We started just last year, as of today, we have over a million people who have our carry cards with them. And we are this month aggressively marketing that carry card system because we are very much aware that we're about to, uh, in about a year and a half, we will be um, putting up a a rail system. The water transportation is also now ramping up. So we want to be certain that we have adequate reach because we don't want to go down the route of paper ticketing. So, and we're not doing that for a whole year. We haven't done that on regulated transportation system and it's been successful but we just want to increase the reach. We'll keep opening up and we hope that in another couple of years, two to three years, we'll be able to open it up so that um, any form of um, payment card will be able to tap on any of our validators. Excellent. Thank you, Evan Bola. John, uh, what are your plans for the future to deliver more connected journeys for your passengers? Talk about the opportunities and the innovations that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, our plan uh, to deliver more connected journeys for our passengers is uh, is very wide. And uh, uh, right now, at the first step, we are we are preparing to launch the study of the fare management system, which is very key because uh, which is uh, also one of the biggest issue uh, when it comes to. Uh, Integrate different modes and uh, line of uh, transport system in the in the city because when it comes to fare collection, when it comes to uh, distribution and so on, all those activities, it is a very tricky task. So we are launching out this study because we want to have a global overview of uh, what is possible, and uh, we also want have to uh, have, would like to have a very sound. Uh, a benchmark with what is done internationally so that we can choose the, the system that is the main the, the, the main the, what is the the best working for, for our city and which is matching our, our needs. So the the, the, the the TY and all those documents for the tender are okay now. So we are preparing to launch this very important study because uh, uh, integration is something that we keep in mind in all the projects that we are leading right now. We also have the, we, we just come to finish the study of the financing of uh, the Abidjan Sustainable Transport System, which is very important for us and which is, I can say, the, the one of the more, most important uh, thing that can bring the shift in the management of the transport in this area because uh, 
the problem with the financing is always the, 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 the biggest one in developing countries. So we want the government to, because in, during the study, we have identified some taxes that should normally, or that could partly be allocated to Amiga so that we can have relevant means and uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, financial, uh, I can say, resources to leverage additional one uh, to implement and to finance uh, our, our, our plans. So this study is, is, is finished now. So we are now in, in the discussion with, the, with our government uh, about the, the tax uh, allocation. So this step is very important for us and uh, this will help us to have uh, what is required and uh, uh, we, are, we are working on it. After that, we have the Abidjan Urban Mobility Project, which is financed both by uh, uh, I have the AFD, uh, French Development Agency and uh, the World Bank. And uh, in the framework of this project, we have the implementation of the East-West Fast Rapid Transit Corridor between Yopougon and Benjaville, which is a municipality in the outskirts of uh, the city of Abidjan. It also includes the implementation of a physical uh, and fair integration system a parking management, a traffic management, non-motorized transport plan, and, uh, and, and a strategy for supporting transit-oriented development within the project area of influence, particularly in the area of Yukugon. We are also uh, in the frame of this project uh, working on strengthening the SOTRA, which is the historical transport operator in Abidjan that had been created uh, in 1960 and uh, which is operating nowadays around 2,000 buses in the city of Abidjan. So we are also thinking uh, uh, to restructure uh, the, the feeder system to the mass transit link. And SOTRA will be playing a key role in this uh, feeder system. And also, this, as I said, we are also working on the prof professionalization of the informal actors, we also, which also will have to play a key role uh, uh, because they, they will be the one operating on the first and last kilometers in the daily trip of the Abidjan city, citizens. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, congestion is uh, one of the biggest problems that we are also facing here because we have changed the regulation, we have limited the, the, the condition of importation of second hand vehicles from developed countries. Nowadays, you cannot uh, import a vehicle of more than five years. And we are going to, to improve, I mean, those regulations because uh, uh, we are talking about climate. When we have to construct a BRT lane or metro project, we, we are spending so much money on, on climate issues that it is, not, it is nonsense to be uh, especially uh, facing these kind of expenses and also being importing uh, a second hand vehicle which are really polluting. So, so we are also going to have a very sound regulation about, about climate uh, issues and about second hand vehicle. I think that normally we are maybe planning to, to stop maybe the importation if possible because uh, it, is, it is very important for us. And, uh, we plan also to rapidly have a very integrated uh, ticketing and fare management system. So this is global, not only on the mass transit line that we are preparing, but also uh, on the organized private operators. Because uh, for and to 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 reach this uh, this goal, uh, and in the framework of the renewal, we also plan to directly embed the required IT solution in the new vehicle that will be uh, provided to the informal uh, organized uh, uh, operators. Because if we ask them later to, to improve the system, to, to try to get at the level of what we are doing for the mass transit line to be difficult, maybe they will also, like always in Africa, waiting for support from the government. So what we do is that we want to renew the fleet, the vehicle fleet. While renewing it, we, we embed everything that is required in terms of IT solution, in terms of uh, passenger and ticketing and, thing, and, and all those fair collection system, uh, so that when we are ready to, to, to embark them to, to 
make them join the, the, the integrated network, uh, it, it, it is it easier for us. So That's these good. are what we are we are working on, and uh, the and and then we have forgotten this since the beginning. We are also working on the water transport uh, because there is lagoon everywhere in Abidjan. So we are developing now. There are two private operators which are operating uh, along with Sotra, uh, the, 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 the Legon transport system, the ferry. But uh, we are now uh, trying to ourselves construct, I mean, build some, some Legon station. We want to have Legon station everywhere where needed because the private operators in, in the framework of the PPP project are not uh, meeting all the requirement that we have been expecting for them. So the government has decided to, to, to build uh, multimodal and shared uh, uh, legon station so that all the operators can come at the same place and take the passengers because in the we, we win them we want them to be uh, complementary and not uh, in competition so that they, everyone is, is constructing a, a small uh, unusable uh, station here or, or over there we want multimodal system with a, a, a Good parking so that we can improve the the, the, the shift from private vehicle to, to the lagoon uh, transport to the ferry, uh, and this is one of the main uh, specificity of the city of Abidjan, and we want to take advantage uh, of it. And uh, let's have the same question then for uh, it's about what are your plans for the future to deliver more connected journeys for your passengers for Ahmed. Um, well, here in Dubai, of course, um, uh, as I said, technology is our, our main focus going forward. So um, on, on a couple of maybe levels, uh, one is obviously uh, we already have a journey planner here in Dubai and uh, we require that all modes of transport and mobility, be it, uh, you know, backbone, public transport, mm -hmm. traditional public transport solutions or soft mobility solutions like cycling and, and scooters, they all need to be integrated into uh, our uh, um, government supplied uh, mobility as a service uh, platform. Uh, that's a requirement for any operator in Dubai. So whoever is providing cycling services, scooter services will be required by law to actually integrate into the single uh, to like a mobility platform. So that for us is very important to ensure that people uh, have a choice, but at the same time, that choice is not leading to confusion. It's actually um, uh, the, the platform allows them to understand what are the different choices and options they have and how they can plan their journey from, uh, from end to end using different modes, how much it will cost them, and then eventually also integrating payment into that uh, platform as well. So uh, we have a roadmap for moving to board mobility um, as a service. Uh, but I think it's also very important to know that as we all renew our fleet of, um, of, of you know, metros and, and, and buses and so forth. So here in Dubai, for example, recently we've purchased about 700 new buses, and these buses have extremely amazing technology capabilities within them. Uh, they store, they're actually pretty much IoT devices on the road, basically. <laughs> now, how much you benefit from these technologies is up to you as an authority. So we are setting up, for example, a command and control center now where all our new buses will be monitored in real time. Um, and we're, only, we're monitoring not only operational aspects of these buses, such as fuel levels. So previously, for example, a simple example, you wouldn't know whether a bus is close to running out of fuel unless the driver informed you. Uh, but now you actually the system, uh, the buses uh, have that capability to inform the control center um, and you can set thresholds to tell you, to, uh, to alert you when a certain bus is running out of fuel, a simple example. But more advanced than that, these buses are actually recording all sorts of driving behavior. Uh, they're recording harsh braking, they're recording, you know, uh, changing lanes uh, in, an, in a disorderly manner. And they're recording uh, activities or actions that we normally wouldn't know about unless, God forbid, there's an accident or we get passenger complaints. And the idea is, can we leverage these technologies that are on board these uh, new buses and other modes as we go forward to actually become proactively in control of what's going on and to manage the customer experience before being reactive and waiting for complaints and accidents, God forbid, to, um, to happen. Uh, so that's more in the, in, the, in the near future. I think in the, in the mid-future, mid I think Dubai... Um, wants to become a leading city when it comes to autonomous uh, passenger transport. Um, we already have an, uh, a driverless metro here since 2009. But I think uh, for those of you who may be aware, three months ago approximately, we announced a very strategic partnership with Cruise from the United States 
Um, and uh, we we are are aiming to bring autonomous taxis to Dubai uh, gradually, of course, starting from 2023. Uh, we believe that uh, as a city, we are ready for that. And at the same time, the technology is maturing and Cruise is one of the leading uh, players worldwide when it comes to autonomous uh, transport. They already provide similar services in, in some of the United States cities like San Francisco and Arizona. And we want to become one of the first cities outside of the United States to offer a commercial autonomous taxi service by 2023, hopefully. Uh, and then following that up with other modes of autonomous transport, such as buses and, and even marine uh, marine vessels as well. So uh, this is kind of where we're headed in, uh, in the future. Maybe just a quick comment, uh, Paul, on, on what uh, was mentioned previously around uh, ticketing. Um, I think one of the things that we've experimented in Dubai and fairly successful, maybe something to be considered by other cities, uh, we've had, of course, an integrated ticketing system here since 2009. But recently, we've actually tied a loyalty program to our ticketing system, similar to what airlines have done. But for the first time, maybe definitely in the Middle East, maybe one of the first few cities worldwide to actually offer points for passengers who actually use public transport. And then they can redeem those points um, with discounts and retail outlets and other, uh, other facilities. So this is also another way that we feel is encouraging because people like this concept of, of points. And they like yes. to be able to, you know, gather points and then look at how many points they have and then use those points to get discounts, etc. So this concept that does very well in airlines, but has not really been experimented with that much when it comes to public transport. So we've done that in Dubai for the next couple of years. And I must say that it's been fairly successful, even though it's only uh, about a year and a half since we've launched it. So that's something also to be considered by authorities looking at different ways of how we can get more and more people to use public transport. Yeah, that gamification is so important. And you're right, Ahmed, almost no one is doing that. Uh, there's a train service in Germany that does it. I wrote an article for a magazine a year or so ago about it, just the dearth of this. So I'm really happy to see. Do you feel like it's a successful program? Are people using it? Yes, it, it, it's been it's been actually uh, it, it's increased the uptake uh, of, of passengers uh, for our uh, unified ticketing uh, card. Um, and with that, of course, we get more and more insights as to who our passengers are and allows us to understand their trends and, you know, their their uh, preferences. So it helps us to plan public transport in a better way. Uh, and, and also the private sector has been very involved. So we've been able to get a lot of retailers to become part of the scheme. So it's really working both ways, good for retailers, good for us as an authority to increase ridership, and of course, good for the customer as well. So it seems to be a very promising solution. It may not work in all cities, but I think it's something worth considering for sure. That's excellent. Thank you. And finally, Abin Bola, briefly, uh, could you kind of address any new technologies that you haven't mentioned already? For us, it's um, ITS, like you say, it's e-ticketing, but I'm really encouraged by what Ahmed has just said, because in Lagos, like I said, it's being a year that we've been uh, using this um, e-ticketing. And this month, we're experimenting with the uh, loyalty points and, and trying to work with um, retailers to see if we could get them to give cash tokens that they can now be redeemed at uh, various um, retail outlets. So it's fantastic to hear that it's been successful in Dubai. It's something that we've started to look at this month, and hopefully we will um, get some level of... Um, um, success from it as um, Dubai seems to be getting because for us it's something we're looking at to increase ridership and um, this month is when we were because as part of our one year celebrations is one of the things that we're looking at doing so yeah that's I great really to hear that. <laughs> yes very good well this has been great thank you so much to our guests Ahmed Abimbola and John for sharing with us um, how you are moving to a future of integrated public transportation to pull people back into mass transit and public transportation. Great insights today. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for Trapeze for sponsoring this webinar. We appreciate you being with us today, and hopefully it informed you on how to better improve your transit system heading into the future. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Take care. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged in Depth a special rebroadcast of the Connected Journeys webinar recorded earlier this summer. Thanks again to our guests for the really great insights into both the future of transit and how similar the challenges transit agencies face are all around the world. Now, next week on Transit Unplugged News and Views, we'll be hearing from regular contributor Mike Bismeyer, who will be chatting with Paul about his Kindness is Cool campaign and the award he just won at the Canadian 
Urban Transit Association. Paul will also be chatting with Roger Helmy of Medaxo about the future of transit and some things they're looking forward to this year. As always, if you have feedback or a question or would like to be a guest on Transit Unplugged, email us at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.